Good evening, everyone. How are we all doing on this fine Friday evening? Very good. I love to hear this. Well, welcome. Uh, if you're new here, I know no one's new here, but if you're new tuning in online, we want to say welcome. Bienvenidos. This is uh, Mishkan David, which is just Hebrew for Tabernacle of David. And uh, we are gathered here for a very, very special reason tonight. And what reason is that? It is Shabbat. Thank the Lord. Yes. Why are we celebrating Shabbat, though? Because uh, the reason why we believe the Lord raised up this place was to confirm and uh, accomplish what was given to us in Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. It says that in the last days, the tabernacle of David would be raised up again to close up the breach because there has been a breach well over 2,000 years between Jewish people and non-Jewish people. We've been fighting and killing and doing the whole nine and arguing this whole time. And then after the breach would be closed, it says that he would restore the ways of old. We're going back to the original blueprint. And how do you do that? You do that by coming in agreement in the name above every name, whom the world calls Jesus the Christ. We like to call him by his original name, which was Yeshua. And that's just Hebrew for salvation, because the word of God says when you lift him up, he will draw every man to himself, because he was the way, the truth, and the life. We want to follow him and do everything he said and do everything like he did it. So if we come in agreement in him, then we're cooking with gas. Everything else is semantics after that, and it says that the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth. So that's why it's a very special occasion, because we are celebrating the first feast that was instituted by the King of the Universe. And I'm sure, just like myself, you're all very happy to be here, and it's amazing that we can finally gather together two loaves being waved in front of the Lord to sit in heavenly places even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And behind me here, we have the Shabbat table. Very, very important for us. We have the candles, the bread, and the wine. All of these elements go into the introduction of the Shabbat. And if you're wondering why there's a setup like this, uh, the, the best biblical reference for the Shabbat table or the Levitical table can be found in Exodus chapter 40. It gives very specific references of how it's going to be set up, specifically with the candles and the showbread, all the things that go into serving the Lord in his house. And then, of course, um, it all points to Messiah Yeshua. Everything points to to him and that's the whole point of the old and the new is because he was a perfect combination of both it wasn't a 50 50 is a hundred percent of the word and a hundred percent a hundred percent of the spirit together and so that should be our ultimate goal the ultimate achievement like the word of god says to be conformed into hinge image and so i would ask that you please uh, rise and come in agreement with me as we do the candle, uh, the candlelight blessing or the blessing over the candles. Uh, our dear Rebinson is going to come and light the candles. The reason why we light the candles on the Shabbat and the reason why it's lit by a woman is a fulfillment of prophecy. And we reference Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, which is the reference that the Lord said himself he would give his people a sign that a virgin would give birth and that she would call him Im Anuel, which means God is with us. And then again, later on in Matthew chapter 1, it says again, after it gives the entire genealogy of Jesus, of Yeshua, it says in the last two verses, in 20 and 21, that this is the one that the prophecy was talking about. And so, our dear Rebinson is going to light the candles for us, signifying that the prophecy has been fulfilled and that the light of the world did come in through a woman. ברוכתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר קידשנו בדברו ונתן לנו את ישוע משיקנו וציווינו להיות אור העולם. 
Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Bendito eres tú, Señor nuestro Dios, Rey del Universo. Tú nos has santificado con tu palabra, nos has dado Yeshua, nuestro Mesías, y nos has mandado a ser una luz para el mundo. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Robertson. The light of the world did indeed come to pass. And the next prayer we have on the screen here is the blessing over the bread. Our handy dandy Adrian is going to come up and uh, help me present this to you guys. Uh, in Adrian's hands here, we have the challah. Now, why do we reference the challah? If you weren't able to participate in uh, Shavuot with us, in the Feast of Weeks with us, we have everything archived. It gives a beautiful, beautiful representation, especially last week's message of the challah and, and why the challah is presented. It is a leavened loaf, even though, uh, you know, the Feast of Unleavened Bread proceeded before that, and many, many beautiful reasons that we don't have time to get into, so we encourage you to please go and watch that message so you could truly understand the full meaning of the loaf of bread, of there being two loaves of bread, but we present this on Shabbat every single week. Um, because, again, everything points to the Messiah. Our goal is to understand him, where he came from, where he was born, his task here on earth, the things that he fulfilled, the things that he came here to do, and what he was about and why he did it. And so this is a fulfillment for us of biblical prophecy again because we're going back to the original blueprint we can find in Micah chapter 5 in verse 2. Um, because many of our Jewish brothers and sisters, they like to argue the prophecies saying that it wasn't about Jesus, it was about somebody else. But we have the ability to weave through that with the discernment of the Holy Spirit. And why we present uh, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, because it gives us an exact location of where the Messiah would be born. And uh, it says there specifically that he would be born in a town called Bethlehem Ephrataz, the phrase, that's, the phrase that's used. And in English, Bethlehem Ephrataz doesn't mean anything, but in Hebrew we find the true meaning of it, which Bethlehem is two Hebrew words, the word Bet, which means house, and the word Lechem, which means bread, and then Ephrata means fruitful, or in a, in, in a phrase, to be fruitful. And so... Our Messiah himself was declared to be born in a town called the Fruitful House of Bread. And so he declared himself to be the bread from heaven. He was described as the bread from heaven in several references in the word of God. And so amazingly as well, he was also declared the first fruit. He was the first to conquer death. He was the first to show us how to combine the righteousness of God, which is found in the Word of God, and grace and truth through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so since he was the first, it means that the rest of us would follow after. And we have that beautiful reference given to us in the Word of God, again, to give us the evidence of our faith. So we know exactly where he is born. If you have been with us to Israel, we have been to the town. We have been to uh, the sites where he was. Very, very beautiful. But secondly as well, because it is Shabbat, uh, we participate in what the church world calls communion. And if you haven't had a chance, we have the elements there in the back. There's the matzah, the wine, and the juice. And uh, we participate in communion, not because of what was given to us in the new covenant, but what was established in the old. The Levitical priesthood were the first ones to partake of bread and wine before the Lord. And so when our Messiah Jesus came, and on the night of Passover, uh, they call it the Last Supper, but indeed it was the start of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pesach, so technically it's the first supper, he took a piece of matzah, of unleavened bread, and he passed it around to his disciples, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me, which is a fulfillment of the prophecies given to us in the first covenant, to partake of the bread of life, to partake of the unleavened bread of God. And why it was unleavened? Because it was a representation of himself. Because without leaven, there is no sin. So that's why he passed around the unleavened bread. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. So every single week we thank him, we acknowledge him for the breaking of his body on our behalf, knowing that he took the punishment so that we didn't have to. 
And so our dear Adrian is going to sing this for us in Hebrew and then give us the translation in English. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who issues forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and never taste death. Amen. If you feel led, please partake in his body. The next prayer that's going to be on the screen there is the blessing over the wine. Very, very significant for us. And what Adrian has in his hands here is the servant's cup or a goblet or um, a Levitical cup it is uh, purchased from Israel. It is meant to be a physical representation of perhaps what the cups would look like that were in service to the Lord. Obviously, um, the Torah describes them being of pure gold. And uh, we're a non-for-profit organization, so we don't have one of those up here. But uh, regardless, what's important is the contents of the cup. It's wine. And if you know your word a little bit, you know that wine represents blood. Now, why would Messiah lift up a cup of wine on the night of Passover? Because, again, it was a fulfillment of what was established in the first covenant, the first time that human beings had to receive an atonement of blood for their sins was all the way in the beginning in Genesis. When Adam and Eve committed the first sin against the Lord, they only had one commandment to keep, and they couldn't even keep that, which was don't eat from that tree, from that forbidden fruit. And, of course, the devil came and worked his magic there, caused them to doubt what the Lord said, X, Y, Z, you know the story. They sinned. And, of course, what happened? They sinned. They knew they sinned. They realized they were naked, and their consciences were turned on. They, heart, they started to feel guilt. They started to feel shame. And the first thing as human beings, when we feel guilt and shame, we hide. We isolate ourselves. And so they went, and they hid inside a bush, and they were hiding from the Lord. And the Lord was showing us his character from day one. Despite knowing everything all at once, all the time, he knew exactly where they hid, what they did. And regardless, though, he still chose to go out into the garden and call them by name, to give them a chance to reveal themselves. It's the same thing that the Lord has done for each and every single one of us. He calls you out individually to bring you unto himself. And of course, they had man-made garments that they gave for themselves to cover their nakedness. And he said, no, your covering is not sufficient. You require my covering. And so he stripped them of those fig leaves that they had sewed together. He slew an animal on their behalf and covered them in animal skins. And then, of course, later on, the Lord gave us the sacrificial system with the covenant given to the children of Israel under Mount Sinai. And then, of course, because as human beings we continue to err, we broke that too. Just like it lays out in Jeremiah chapter 31 that even though he was a husband to us, we still broke it. But instead of smoking us all in our sneakers in that very moment, he's still showing his character, ever-present love, a forever love, an unconditional love for his creation. He sent one sacrifice, finally, for all of our past, present, and future sins so that we could obtain grace. Not grace to abuse the covenant that has been given to us, but grace to accomplish the covenant that's been given to us because we will make mistakes many mistakes all along the way but now we no longer have to hide from God we can pick ourselves back up and run straight to him and so he picked up that cup and he said this is the blood of my new covenant and again our dear Adrian is going to sing this for us and we're going to partake with him in English Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei pri hagafen Amen Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And as King David said, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. 
If you feel led, taste and see, please. And if the Lord is good in your life, say amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Now, everything here that Adrian and I presented on the table, the candles, the bread, and the wine, this is a very Hebraic roots version of the presentation of the gospel. Why? Because we want to derive exactly who he is, like I said, where he was born, where he came from, why he came, which can be found in the first covenant. It is not a separate covenant. It is just the first edition that was completed in the, second, in the new covenant given to us by our Messiah Yeshua. And so we have where uh, the prophecy fulfilled of being born of a woman and being called to the light of the world, where he was born, the reason why his body was broken, and the reason why he shed his blood on our behalf. And this is an invitation. And we present this at the beginning of our service every single week for those of us who haven't heard it. And if you've heard it again, it's a good reminder. The Lord does a lot of repetition. So for me personally, I never get bored of the Lord's stuff because it's awesome to be reminded every single week. But then again as well, this is our invitation to the world. This is our invitation to partake in the covenant with the Lord because he doesn't want anyone to perish. The word says that it grieves him if even one of us shouldn't make it. And so, of course, again, it is Shabbat, which is a Hebrew word for rest, and the Lord wants his people to rest. Messiah's some of his most favorite, famous words were, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so he desires us to have rest. He desires us to have peace. Not only just physically, because you can physically rest, but internally have no peace. And so this is an invitation to its internal peace, which is even more important and more precious than physical rest. And unfortunately, you cannot partake in individual internal peace if you don't have the spirit of peace from the Prince of Peace living in and with you. And so we invite you to accept the Lord's sacrifice on your behalf. Start your relationship with Him so you can start experiencing His goodness and the wonders that all of us, many of us here, have partaken in already. And then after that, it's not over. Once you get saved, there's a continuation. Salvation is just a ticket to get onto the train. Then after that, we have a final destination. We have the rest of our lives to live. And of course, the next practical question would be, well, how do we live our lives then? Exactly how he told us how to live our lives. And so this next prayer on the screen is the Shema, which this is the first edification of uh, what he gave. The most important thing within the entire word of God can be found what he said in Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. And then, of course, again, because it was his job, he was fulfilling the first covenant, which this reference that he gave, which is loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, is originally found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And of course, he gave that to us and he raised the standard by adding the word mind because the spirit and the kingdom of heaven is within us now. And so this is how we start walking with the Lord. This is how he heals you, how he restores you, how you keep covenant with him and he keeps covenant with you is by loving him with everything that you have, all of who you are, which he never would ask us to do something that he hasn't already done. Messiah Yeshua said, there is no greater love a man has than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life first, and so he's just asking us to do the exact same thing. We pick up our cross daily and follow him by doing this prayer right here. So please join me as we declare our ability to be in his presence, our, our uh, call to faith, first in Hebrew, then in English. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Bauch Shem Kevot, Malchuto Leolam Vahed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Amen. Please give him a round of applause because this is awesome. For all my believers from New York, this is awesome. 
Now, after the Shema, after you start hearing his voice, because he speaks, after you start being in his presence, because he's always there, after you start walking with him, becoming obedient, he starts to keep his promises that he gave to us, which is to heal you, to restore you, to bless you. And then once you start experiencing him, because you can only be thankful or have gratitude once you've experienced God, you can't be thankful for something that you don't have. And so, once he starts doing that for you, after you start loving him, and then you receive his love back, we participate in this prayer, which is the Kiddush prayer. This is honoring him for who he is. Just who he is, is good enough. Then after that, he chose us. He chose each and every single one of us in this room, because no man comes unto the Father unless he was drawn. So if you're here, it's because he wanted you to be here. Then, of course, he gave us the Shabbat, a day to set us apart from the rest of the world. No one else who participates in the covenant has it like how we have it. And then, of course, he gave us his word, his commandments to help us along the way so we could understand him and we could understand the discernment of his his voice. And so for all these things, all of the above, we say thank you. And then, of course, not only is this a day of rest, but Moses tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 5 that the Shabbat is also a day of remembrance because we've all gone through crazy things in this life and we've all made it to this very moment. So the fact that our eyes were open this morning and we were given again the breath of life and everything that we've gone through until now, it's worth it. Dayenu. And so we thank him for that. So please again, first in Hebrew, join me, and then in English. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor, he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose, and us did you sanctify from all the nations. And your holy Sabbath with love and favor did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Amen. Now this last prayer that we're going to partake in before we go into worship is the refuah, or the prayer for healing. And of course, because we have this plaque right here, we still believe in miracles. Because many of us have uh, received miracles from the Lord, we've seen miracles happen, and of course, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the fantastic, amazing things that we read that have transpired in the Bible are still relevant and can and will happen today, but you have to do it his way. And so, because we lift up His way here, and we do our very best to anyway, uh, we've seen many miracles happen. It's not a guarantee, of course, because He does whatever He wants, whenever He wants to do it. The most important thing is we come in agreement in His name, and He will do His work. But one thing that over the years that we've found is you can start observing patterns because the Lord loves to reveal His character, who He is, how He operates. It helps us be in order together. It helps us walk together. All of those amazing things to give us a clear path and a direction. And so one of the many things that we've observed is how important it is to the Lord to have a clean heart. Because when you're walking with Him and you're walking in the Spirit, you're called to live life at another level. It says that when the devil floods the world with his mouth, the Lord would raise up a standard. And the standard was our Messiah Yeshua. And so he advocated for walking in forgiveness. And it's not even just for the other person. It's for you. Because for unforgiveness is like swallowing a poison pill expecting the other person to die. Nothing will happen to the other person if you have unforgiveness towards them. All you're doing is poisoning yourself. And so oftentimes we find when you're poisoning yourself, your body after a while, it takes a toll. And so we declare open forgiveness every single week so that if that portion of your heart is being blocked from allowing you to be in the presence of the Lord and fully receive His blessing, His restoration, His love, we can at least check that off the list and say, hey, I don't have unforgiveness, Lord. I have a clean heart. 
And so we declare this prayer for healing together as a family every single week. First, clearing our hearts of any malice. And then, of course, when we do anything together, it says it takes two in agreement touching anything it's powerful. And so we are in agreement, acknowledging him for who he is, what he will do, and of course, acknowledging the righteousness and the holiness in which he has called us to operate. So please join me again, first in Hebrew and then in English. Raphaenu Adonai vene Rafe, Hoshienu vene Vashiach. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. Katilatenu Ata. For you are our praise. And bring complete healing for our ailments. May it be your will, O Lord our God, and God of our forefathers. That you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven. Spiritual healing and physical healing. For you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. Amen. Now our dear brother Ivan is going to come and do the call to worship for us by blowing the shofar. Many amazing references as to why the shofar is blown in the Bible. But of course, the most important one is that this is the signal of his return. So here we like to get used to the sound so that we're not surprised however many years down the road we hear it. We'll know exactly what it means. And then, of course, our Rebbitzin is going to take us through praise and worship because, as the Word of God says, we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. And I always like to close with this. If you're new here or you come from a church background and you're unfamiliar with Hebrew and Hebrew proceedings, and I get it, it's weird. The whole Jesus thing was very weird for me too as a Jew. We have to get used to it together, right? But the Word of God promises that whether Jew or not Jew, once the Holy Spirit is within you, there is no difference. Rav Shaul wrote that now there is neither man nor woman nor Jew nor Greek. That doesn't mean that there is no genders. We don't believe in that garbage. But what it means is that there is now no longer separation between Jew and non-Jew. So you're either Israeli through the power of the Holy Spirit or you're Israeli by blood, and both are very, very good. And so we claim back Hebrew as our native language. It is the heavenly language. It is the language that the Lord blessed and used for his people for many, many, many generations. So we love you all, and Shabbat Shalom. Blessed are thee, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted his commandments and commands us to hear the sound of the shofar. Lord, let the sound of your voice and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to thee, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May you make harmony in the heavenly realms. May you make peace for us, for Israel, and for all your people everywhere. Amen. Vaihi ere vaihi boker yom hashishi. Vaiholu hashamayim beharats bechol svaam. Vaihal eloim ba yom hashvi'i milato asherasa. Vaihishpot ba yom hashvi'i mikol milato asherasa. Vaihbaech eloim et yom hashvi'i vaikadesh oto. Kiwo shabbat mikol milato asher bara eloim la asot. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. 
And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us a Shabbat of rest, one day of rest from our labors, a day of refreshing, a day where we can rest our hearts, our minds, and our souls, not just a day of rest for our, our, our physical bodies, but a, a day of rest for, for all of our labors, for our, our physical body and for our spirit, and a day of fellowship, because true rest is found in fellowship with you, Lord. A day of fellowship, of rest and fellowship with you in your presence and with one another. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, the keeper of promises, the promise that you made at the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, a promise that you said would send a deliverer, a Messiah, a Savior, to save all of us, to save the world, save humanity from its fallen condition, to save us, indeed save us from ourselves. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because you are a keeper of promises, you sent Messiah Yeshua, our Messiah, our Redeemer, who manifested as the greatest rabbi that ever lived so that he could teach us exactly how to walk in righteousness and help us to understand by his own example that obedience equals blessing, Lord, because salvation is free. It is a free gift. All we have to do is accept it. But to enjoy favor and blessing from you, Lord, to enjoy a state where you smile upon us at all times, that is predicated on obedience. But Messiah Yeshua taught us through the power of the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the Torah that we now have everything we need to be obedient sons and daughters of the living God, that it's a matter of where we put our free will, that we are no longer a slaves to sin, that we can turn away from it, that we have the power to do that. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah Yeshua taught us that true righteousness begins in the heart first, and that if you cleanse the inside of the cup first, the outside would be clean as well. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah will return again very soon, just as the angels promised the disciples who were standing on the Mount of Olives, looking up into heaven, watching Messiah Yeshua ascend into the heavenly realm. The angels said, this same Messiah, this same Jesus, this same Yeshua, which you have seen ascend, will descend, just like you saw him. He will come back, and he will set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and he will take his rightful place on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And he will establish as king and high priest. He will establish, O Lord our God, your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And at long last, bring about true peace on earth and goodwill to all men. And as we enter into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise on your Shabbat, Lord, on this generous day that you've given us, this day of rest and fellowship and joy, with you and with one another. We begin with the psalm, the words of the psalm who said, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. We praise you, we thank you, Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, eternity's holy King.
sing that again. Thank you, O oh Lord, for giving us this Shabbat, this time of rest for our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And we remember the words of the psalmist who said, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. My soul, our soul, finds rest only in you, Lord. My soul finds rest in God alone, my peace depends on Him. In this place of quiet rest, He fills me from within. He pours on 
Shabbat is such a wonderful time. Not only a time of fellowship and peace, it's a time to, to rest our souls from the madness of the world outside and to pray as we light the Shabbat candles. We remember friends, families, even our enemies, and we lift them up in prayer. And we remember the words of the psalmist who said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity, my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when you may be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. You, O Lord, are my hiding place, and you shall preserve me from trouble. You shall compass me about with songs of deliverance.
The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. And the Lord is near to all who call on him. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. somebody a Shabbat Shalom and share a smile and a word of encouragement.
Shabbat Shalom. It's good to praise the Lord. Thank you, honey. Thank you, dancers. May we shut off the tunnel fans, please, so I don't blow away here. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Anyone happy to be in the house of the Lord besides me? Hallelujah. What the Lord said, where two or three are gathered in his name. Are we gathered in his name? Can we say his name in Hebrew? Yeshua. No, a little louder. He said, there am I in the midst of thee. Which means one thing God cannot do, the only thing God cannot do, everything is possible, but one thing he cannot do is lie. Amen. Don't you wish you could say that about yourself? <laughs> Bunch of liars here. But God cannot lie. And so if he says he's here, he's here. We're gathered in his name. Yeshua, the name above every name, the only name given under heaven where you can be saved. Amen. Aren't you glad you called upon the name of the Lord? Best decision I ever made in my life. And so praise God. We're here. He's here. So if we draw close to him, the word of God promises that he will draw close to us. So if you don't have a close encounter with the Lord tonight, it's not because he's not here, it's because you're not here. Somebody say, I'm here. He ain't he, like Abraham said, I'm here. I'm here for you, God. And we're going to focus on him because the Bible says in Isaiah 26 and verse 3 that he would keep us in perfect shalom, in perfect peace whose mind is stayed. Focus tonight, focus. We're going to focus on him. And we're going to enjoy that perfect peace that Rav Shaul, that Paul said, surpasses all understanding. Or King David said, in his presence is fullness of joy at his right hand are pleasures forever and ever. What an awesome God that we serve. We're in a place called Mishkan David. Mishkan, as T likes to point out every week, means tabernacle. The tabernacle of David, of David. King of Israel. And uh, his, his report was that he was a man after God's own heart. And he had a tremendous heart for the Lord. How do we know this? All the psalms he wrote and sang. Talk about an amazing relationship with God. And that's, what, and that's what God wants. He wants relationship. He doesn't want religion. I don't know why people insist on religion. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son what does our Father in heaven want? Yeshua the Son says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No, one, no man comes unto the Father but by me. He wants a father-son, father-daughter relationship. That is a very special, intimate relationship. And once you understand that, you will run from religion like you would run from a rattlesnake. But anyway, religion and relationship with God are diametrically opposed. They're not the same. And our Father in heaven wants this amazing relationship. And once you relate to him as a child of God, your prayers change, your attitude changes. You experience amazing love, perfect love. And uh, just, it, it'll, it'll heal you. It'll restore your soul. It will give you peace. It will give you shalom. It will give you security in an insecure world, in a world that's filled with trouble, in a world that, the people that don't have a relationship with God, they have no peace. Because the Bible says, there's no peace for the wicked. I don't care what you do without God, you can do nothing and you can have no peace. You can have no shalom. But in Him, perfect shalom. Beautiful. But anyway, because we're in a place called Mishkan David, the Tabernacle of David, let's read a psalm from King David. I mean, I wish I had the notes and the music the way he sung these things. I wish I had the original recordings. Could you imagine? So we're going to read a psalm from King David, a song from King David. Uh, psalm 86, we're going to read. Who got that one? No one? You were off again? Psalm guessing. 
You're some guesser. But anyway, Psalm 86, then we'll pray and then we'll talk about the star of the Bible. Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save your servant that trust in you. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee, that call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer. Attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like unto you, O Lord. Neither are there any works like unto your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You are God alone. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength unto your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Amen. Amen. Beautiful psalm. Wow. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, Abba, Abba who is in heaven, we praise you, we thank you tonight, we call upon you. In the name above every name, Abba, fill us with knowledge, your knowledge, your wisdom, your words. Teach us not to live by bread only, but by every word that for, proceeds from your mouth, Lord. Lord, we give you our hearts tonight, not hearts of stone, hearts of flesh, hearts that love you. And as your Brit Hadashah says, as your new covenant says, that you will write your laws in our hearts and in our minds. We are prepared to receive your instructions, Lord, in our lives. Father in heaven, lead us by your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh. Lead us to green pastures, still waters, restore our souls, restore our minds, restore our hearts, restore our bodies. We believe, Father in heaven, that nothing is too difficult for you and that you are still a God of restoration as you restore our brothers and our sisters, we lift up every brother, every sister that could not be here, that is here, that is watching on the internet, Father in heaven, that you would touch, that you would deliver, that you would set the captives free, that you would, that you would break every assignment of the enemy against us, against our brothers and sisters, in the name of Yeshua, every assignment of the enemy. And Father, as we rejoice in our salvation, Heavenly Father, your spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are your sons and your daughters. As we rejoice tonight, our hearts break, our hearts go out for family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers that do not know you, that don't have this amazing relationship that you are, that you are, that you are inviting everyone to have, Father in heaven. We wish that, we pray for every, every person in our lives that don't know you, Lord that you will draw them to yourself as you have done for each and every one of us. Let them taste and see that you are good. Let their names be written in heaven. Our hearts, Father, in heaven, that none should perish. In the name of Yeshua, even our enemies, we pray for and bless our enemies tonight, Lord. In the name of Yeshua. And Father God, bless those watching on the internet. Bless us, lead us to all truth. Set the captives free. Transform each and every one of us by the renewing of our minds, by your word. Cleanse us by your words. Heal us by your words. 
change our minds by your words, Father, in heaven. And we praise you and thank you for giving us power over all the power of the enemy to tread on scorpions and serpents over all the power of the enemy. And your word declares, Father, in heaven, that nothing by any means shall hurt us. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for, for, for the Holy Spirit, for the Ruach HaKodesh, for the Comforter, for the one that will lead us into all truth and show us things to come in our lives. In the name of Yeshua, we come against every spirit of disobedience, every spirit of rebellion, every spirit of anti-Messiah in this place. In the name of Yeshua. And Father in heaven, we praise you, we thank you for every single thing that has happened in our lives to this very moment, knowing, as your word declares, that all things work together for the good because we love you and because you have called us for your purpose. Thank you, Father in heaven, for your purpose to conform each and every one of us into the image of your Son, our Messiah, our King, our Savior, our Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In his name we pray, the name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ, in his name we pray, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. It's a little chilly in here tonight. But anyway, you know, last week, Shavuot, we celebrated Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. We counted the Sabbaths as prescribed in, in the Torah and the law of God. We counted seven Sabbaths plus one day. We counted 50 days. It was last Shabbat. And what I, what I brought up, which many people don't realize, a lot of Christians don't realize that on the first Shavuot, on the first Pentecost, when Israel came out of Egypt, they received the commandments of God. On Mount Sinai, when Moses, of course, went up to Mount Sinai, it says he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So about the 50th day when they came out of Egypt, seven Sabbaths plus one day, God told Moses to bring two tablets of stone, and he wrote with his finger, the Ten Commandments, His Commandments. And of course, many years later, centuries later, Yeshua, who was the Passover lamb, dies on Passover, rises from the dead, tells His disciples, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day fully came, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, known in the church as Pentecost, which just means 50 in Greek, they received the Holy Spirit, the 120 disciples that did obey the Lord and waited in Jerusalem. I'm sure many left, but 120 did stay. And according to Acts chapter 2, they received the power from on high, the Holy Spirit. The best thing that could happen to any human being, like Yeshua said in John chapter 3, is to be born again of the Holy Spirit and to receive the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and of course... Uh, many Christians don't realize that on that Pentecost, that first one, they, Israel received the commandments of God. And then, of course, on that subsequent Pentecost, uh, in the future, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people say that the Holy Spirit, or being the born, born again experience, negates the commandments of God. But it's the opposite. If God would give the commandments on Shavuot and the Holy Spirit on Shavuot, that means He gave the power to keep the commandments of God, not to break the commandments of God. Because we know from Scripture, breaking God's commandments is sin. And when Yeshua the, would be born and an angel Gabriel tells his mom, you're going to have a son. You're going to name him Yeshua. You're going to name him salvation because he's going to save his people from their sin. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, the adversary has been very slick. He's divided the house of God. Jewish people that have the commandments of God, refuse, most of them refuse Yeshua, do not have the Holy Spirit, and many people that are Christians today have the Holy Spirit, refuse the commandments of God. And most people don't realize that God gave these things on the same day. Was He telling us, you need them both together? And in His life, both were together. According to the Word of God, it says the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and the Bible says, we beheld glory. Why is there little or no glory in, in the body of the Messiah or in, or in synagogues today? Because we haven't been able to put it together. In his life, God put everything together in his son. 
for us to see what happens when you put the commandments of God and the Holy Spirit together, you get dynamite, you get glory, you get anointing. If you look behind me here, we have the uh, Ark of the Covenant. We, of course, have the tablets sitting outside the Ark of the Covenant. We have the Torah inside. But above, you see there's a light. It, uh, that, is a role, that is a model of the first covenant where God's glory was above the mercy seat, the cherubims, the angels. God's glory was on, on top or above the commandments of God. In other words, God's been showing us for centuries that there's an anointing upon the Word of God. And so the adversary wants to fill us with tradition. The adversary wants to fill us with commandments of men because there's no glory. Are you with me? If we're going to accept the Holy Spirit in order, in order for the Holy Spirit to manifest, in order for the glory of God to manifest in your life, you need to be filled with God's words, God's commandments, Amen. not man's traditions. And there's some beautiful traditions. There's some beautiful Jewish traditions, and there's some beautiful Christian traditions. But they're traditions. They're made up of people. They're not the commandments of God. Amen. And, there's, and there's a lacking of the power of God in lives that follow the traditions of men or the commandments of men. And the Lord, and the Lord addressed this issue in, in Matthew 15 and verse 7. I, I bring this up all the time because we're... We're just as guilty today as they were guilty of this problem uh, 2,000 years ago. In other words, we still haven't learned this lesson. Or the adversary is that slick that he can fool us for this long. Because the Lord said, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, well, what, did, what did Isaiah say about ancient Israel? And we know from, from history that Isaiah was a prophet that lived about 700 years before the birth of Christ, before the birth of the Mashiach. And so God was already saying this to his people for 700 years. Yeshua just repeated what was already said 700 years. In other words, this problem was going on for 700 years. I would venture to say this problem continues to go on 2,000 more years. In other words, we're pretty thick-headed. I don't care if you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. We're pretty thick in the head. Notice what he said. This people draw nigh unto me, this people in his time, draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But notice what he says. Their heart is far from me. Now the only one that knows where your heart is at at all times is only God. In other words, I see people, I think you all have a heart for God because we're all good actors, can we say? Like Shakespeare said, the world's a stage and everybody's an actor. We put on pretty good acts. But you can't fool God. Like I've told people, you can fool people. You can deceive people, you can fool people, but you cannot fool God. God knows if your heart is on Him or your heart's not on Him. So don't kid yourself. That's why the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Those that come to Him must believe that He is, Hebrews 11 and 6. And that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So if you honor God with your lips and your heart is far from him, good luck. Which I don't believe in luck. I used to. But now I believe in being blessed or even being cursed. Yay or nay? I don't believe as a child of God you're going to be cursed, but you could have a hard time. Ask Israel, who had a hard time in the wilderness for 40 years because they just refused. He would tell them, you do what I tell you, you'll be blessed above everyone else. I mean, no, God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Does he still want us to do what he says? I would think so if he's the same God. So this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but notice, Again, their heart is far from me. In verse 9, bigger problem. But in vain they do worship in me. And what does in vain mean? But in vain they do worship me. In other words, you're wasting your time. But notice how they're wasting your time. On the right God. That's why it's, so, that's why it's such a good deception. Because we're worshiping the right God in the wrong way. 
And people think, no, I'm okay. I got Jesus. Oh, you got Jesus, but you're wasting your time. You got the right God, but in vain you are worshiping God because notice what you're teaching. You're teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, come on. When I first got saved, one of the first things I heard from my Christian brothers and sisters, because I knew nothing about the Lord. I didn't even know he's Jewish. I found that he was Jewish. It took me a while. I thought he was a Catholic. I thought Christ was his last name. My people perish for lack of knowledge. I knew nothing. So I figured, hey, my brothers and sisters, the Christians, must know something. They've had them for 2,000 years. We missed the bus, says Jewish people. They've been on this bus for 2,000 years. They must know what they're talking about. And one of the first things I was told as a believer, forget the commandments of God. Yeshua fulfilled them. He fulfilled the law. You don't have to, Gabriel. And I've never done God's laws before. It sounded pretty good to me. I didn't do anything of God, even though I'm Jewish. You know, my parents said there's no God, you know. I was a Jewish atheist. It's like an oxymoron. Because the word Jew just means worshiper of God, if you didn't know that. I was a worshiper, I was a worshiper of God, but I didn't worship God. I mean, crazy. And so I was taught, forget the commandments of God. So here Christianity, most of Christianity, if we can be honest... And I'm not saying this to put anybody down. This is to exhort. Because when you finally figure it out and you put it together, you're going to see anointing and you're going to see glory and you're going to see power in your life like you have never seen before. You're welcome to, you're welcome not, you're welcome to reject the commandments of God like most Christians. You're welcome to reject Jesus like most Jews. You're welcome to do that. But I'm here to tell you, you're going to suffer for it. And if you're tired of suffering in your life, you're tired of being tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired, I mean, I recommend you do things His way. Amen. And you don't waste your time. Because who wants to waste their time worshiping the right God in the wrong way? He just said, in vain, you're wasting your time. You know how many people I see wasting their time? I see, I see Jewish people rejecting Jesus, worshiping and getting nowhere. And I see a lot of Christians worshiping and getting nowhere and being frustrated. And a lot of people quit. They're like, this doesn't work. You're right. It doesn't work. I don't blame you for quitting. I don't want nothing to do with religion. I don't want anything to do with religion either. I want everything to do with him. Because either he's telling us the truth, either he's showing us the way, either he's showing us the life, or we're wasting our time. And what's the point of wasting your time? I mean, it's Friday night. You could be doing other things if this is a waste of time. It's, 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 you know, it's half drink night or whatever. It's happy hour. I mean, I mean if, the, if God doesn't work, you might as well go to a bar and drink. You might as well enjoy yourself because you're going to die anyway. Well, there's no party. But I mean, why waste our time if we're really gonna if we're really gonna, you know, put some some effort into seeking God and worshiping God? I want to do it in the right way. I don't want to waste my time. And I want to see results. I mean, how do people not see results and continue doing the same thing over? That's insanity. It either works or it doesn't. Either we have power or we don't. But I mean, the adversary is slick because, I mean, he's been a liar from the beginning of time. He's the father of lies. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a good, good liar. And he's gotten many of us. I mean, it says he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He'd love to chew you up and spit you out. But... Um, God has given us power. We know that because most of us know that we are born again of the Holy Spirit. And I know, I, even though I knew nothing about God, I knew that the moment I received the Holy Spirit, I knew at the moment that I was born again because I felt completely different. I felt that shalom, that peace that surpasses all understanding. 
that heaviness came off of me that night, the weight of sin in my life. I felt light like a feather. I slept like a baby that night. And I'll never forget, and I knew nothing about God. I knew nothing about the Bible. I didn't even have, I, I didn't even, I never read the Bible. And I knew nothing about God. But that's what theology is, the study of God. And why do we study God? We should study God because we're made in His image and His likeness. But if the adversary can distort who God is, he will distort us. If you don't have a clear picture of who God is, or a correct picture of who God is, you're going to pay a big price. And, uh, you know, it's like the Lord said to the leaders that were blind. He said, the blind shall lead the blind, and they're both going to fall into a ditch. I mean, that's scary. Uh, Luke chapter 10, we went through this before. Verse 17, are you with me? We're talking about power tonight. Either we have power or we don't have power. And how to access this power. Somebody say, I, I, I have the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit? How to access this power. That's the message for tonight. Uh, verse 17, the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. Is there, name, is there power in the name of Jesus and the name of Yeshua? Yeah. Against who? Against the devil. No wonder the devil wants us praying to Mary and Jehovah and whoever, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Anyone but Yeshua. And, and he said to them in verse 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And then he says in verse 19, Behold, I give to you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I mean, either we have power or we don't have power. Either you're living from, from problem to problem and catastrophe or you're living from glory to glory. Either you're walking in this power or you're not walking in this power. Either you're accessing this power, the power of the Holy Spirit, or you're not. And so that's what we're going to discuss tonight and how the adversary works against us because he knows how it works. I mean, he knows the Word of God just better than we do. I mean, don't kid yourself. He was in heaven. He don't have to believe. He knows that God is. He's seen God. But anyway, notwithstanding in this rejoice not, verse 20, Yeshua said that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. But he said to them in verse 19, I give you power. So are we walking in power? Or are we walking powerless? And how do we access this power? Now go with me to, good question, right? Go with me to 1 Corinthians. Notice what Paul writes here. Um, I believe chapter 1. Chapter 1, uh, verse 17. Let's start there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. We're going to talk about tonight how to walk in this amazing power of the Ruach HaKodesh of the Holy Spirit. And if you're interested, you're going places. If you're not interested, I mean, some people like to be get beat up. I don't know. I mean, I remember when I was a kid in school, I got beat up by the bullies. And my parents said, you need, you need to learn how to fight. Now, my parents were not fighters because they weren't in school. I had to learn how to fight. They signed me up for karate school. In other words, I was sent to a place to defend myself because they were a bully. Are there still bullies in school today? You see, people don't change. You still have jerks that want to bother you. Well, the devil's a jerk that wants to bother you and mess with you. So we come here for spiritual karate. Are you with me? Against bullies, you need physical karate. I learned physical karate. Let me tell you something. I got in a couple of fights. The word got around. Everybody left me alone. <laughs> you slap a couple of boys around, they know that he knows karate. You don't think the devils talk like that? He knows. She knows. They know. Don't mess with those people. This one doesn't know. That one doesn't know. Let's go pick on them. 
if he's a predator, if he walks about as a roaring lion, who do predators pick on, the strong or the weak? Hello? So, I mean, if you enjoy being beat up, this, this is not for you. Some people are gluttons for punishment. I don't know. I'm not. Given a choice, let's say. So verse 17, for Messiah, for Christ, sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of the Messiah should be made of none effect. Now notice what Paul says in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish stupidity. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us, which are what? Saved. Somebody say, I'm saved. So people who aren't saved, the cross is meshugana, crazy. Doesn't make sense. Makes no sense. But to us that are saved, it should make total sense because it is the power of God. The cross is the power of God. Not only that he died on the cross, but we are supposed to turn our what over to the cross? Our flesh. Because if you don't turn your flesh over to the cross in your own life, you're going to walk with no power. The power of God is accessed when we crucify our flesh. Are you with me? That's the only way to access the power of God. You can think about the flesh all day long if you want to. Or you can think about God all day. It's your choice. See, the flesh, we don't need a Bible to teach us the flesh has no power. What's wrong with our flesh? It dies. Our flesh is death. You don't need a Bible to teach you your flesh is on slow cook. 98.6 degrees. We're on a slow roast in case you haven't noticed. We're on a rotisserie. You know, that's how you get meat real tender. You cook it slow. In case you haven't noticed, we're on slow cook. It's 72 degrees in here, but inside here it's 98.6. I'm in a rotisserie. I'm being slowly cooked from the inside. Yay or nay? Is that normal temperature, 98.6? If you get a fever, you cook a little quicker. That's why you get shorter when you get older, you're melting. You're shrinking. Meat shrinks. I was six foot three a few years ago. There's shrinkage? No, but I mean, but my point is, we don't need a Bible to teach us that our physical existence is temporary at best. So if you only seek after the temporary, there's no power there because it's not it's limited. Our physical life is limited. No matter how great your physical life can be. I mean, some people have, you know, a, a tremendous physical life, all the food they want to eat, all the clothing, all transportation, but it doesn't matter rich or poor your physical, your physical being is deteriorating. Paul says the outer man is perishing, but the inner man is being renewed daily. And the adversary is so slick, he wants us to always think about what? He wants us to think about God? He wants us to think about our physical existence. To be carnally minded. That's our physical existence. Romans chapter 8 says to be carnally minded is death. So where do you think the adversary is always going? Physical, physical, physical. Where do you think God's going? Spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. And this concept of, of, of seeking God is not a New Testament concept like most people say. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, keep your finger here, 
in 1 Corinthians. Look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I believe in the 20s. Let's see if I can find it. I can name that tune in... Uh, Verse 19, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth, this is Moses, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, Israel, talking to Israel, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, so is it a choice? Has God given you a choice? So Moses says, choose life that both you and and your children and your seed may live. Now notice what he says in verse 20, that you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice and that you may cleave unto him. How I many you know Moses is already teaching the nation of Israel thousands of years ago to cleave unto who? Unto, unto God himself. I mean already being taught spiritual lessons thousands of years ago. This is not a new concept. Moses was saying, cleave unto him. Why? Because for he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. In other words, when you cleave unto God, there is spiritual blessing and physical blessing. Yea or nay? Because we are spiritual beings and we are physical beings. If you do what God says, you get blessed spiritually, and you get blessed physically. Yay or nay? Is he the same God yesterday, today, and forever? He doesn't change. Same message. Was he trying to teach him to be spiritual? Yes. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Back up a little bit here. This is what God was trying to teach the nation of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And the commandments which I command you this day... Verse 1, shall you observe to do that you may what? That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. To what? To humble you? To prove you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. And he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you knew not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know, that he might teach you, that he might make you know. Is God wanting for us to know? He wants to teach us. He wants us to know this. That he might make you know that man does not live. In other words, was God trying to teach spiritual thinking and spiritual minds back then, thousands of years? Why is he trying to teach this to us thousands of years? Because he hasn't changed and we haven't changed. We're still human beings. We're still spiritual beings inside of physical bodies. He took Israel from Egypt. He says, you're my people. I'm going to write my laws and I'm going to tell you what to do. And if you do what I tell you, you'll do better than everybody else. That's our God. He's an awesome God. And so he was trying to get him away from thinking only about bread. Now, honestly, let's be honest. People that aren't saved, or some people that are even saved, what do they talk about all the time? Bread, 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 bread. How much bread you got? How much did that bread cost? Prices on everything. Every time I go out with my brother for dinner, it's how much is this and how much is that? And you know how much it more it is. It's inflation. <laughs> and they complain that it costs more. Yeah, the curse is on you. Because if you're going to think about money, it's going to cost you more every time. <laughs> and like my grandfather used to say, when you have money, everything's cheap. When you ain't got no money, everything's expensive. So everybody that don't have money, what are they complaining about? Did you see how much that cost now? I got this bag of apples last week for $3. Now they cost me $6. Oh, what am I going to do? 
Not only do they think about bread, they worry about it, worry about food, worry about what they're going to live, where they, what, what am I going to do? It's inflation, it's the interest rates, it's this, it's that. Yeshua says life is more than these things. Life is more than these things. Can I teach you that life, that temporary life? And, I, and he, says, he says, your father knows what you have need of before you even ask. You don't think God knows there's inflation? You don't, you don't think God knows interest rates are, have gone up? Rents have gone up? I mean, I was trying to help a friend find an apartment. I'm looking at an apartment. It's a one-bedroom apartment. The cheapest I could see is $1,700 a month for a one-bedroom. When I was 18 years old, I got a one-bedroom. Farnish, $165 a month. And you know what? It was expensive in those days because minimum wage was $1.65 an hour. So it's all relative. Now you make $10, $15 an hour, and it costs 10 times more for a one-bedroom. Two-bedroom? Forget about it. House? Pfft. You need three jobs. But God knows what you have need of before you even ask. And he's telling us not to worry about those things. There's no power in the flesh. The flesh perishes. That's what Yeshua said. So uh, go with me now. Let, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians. We'll get back to that in a minute. Go with me to uh, John 6. From the master, from his mouth directly to us. Somebody said, we're talking about the power of God. So is there power in the flesh and the physical? Verse 61, when Yeshua knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, does this offend you? What and if, verse 62, you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Notice what he says in verse 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. What's the next thing he says? The flesh profits nothing. Repeat that. The flesh profits. Do you need a Bible to teach you that? What's happening to your flesh? 98.6. Slow roast. You know they're trying to shut that off. They're trying to figure out how to shut the oven down. They People get in ice baths. Have you heard of that? They're trying to lower their body temperatures because they realize that they don't want to cook so they don't, they don't want to cook so fast. So if you can lower, but if you lower your body temperature too much, you die. So even God set it up that even if you live in a freezer, <laughs> you can't stop it. You notice you sleep better when it's cold. Some people wake up in the middle of the night all sweating. It wakes you up. So put the air conditioner on real cold. So notice again, verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Bam. Boom. Kaboom. Yea or nay? What's he talking about? Power, Holy Spirit power. And it has nothing to do with the flesh. The flesh, he says, profits nothing. When you're in the flesh, you are separated from the power of God. Paul writes, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the power. Walk in the Spirit. But in order to do that, you got to learn what Israel didn't learn, what most believers still haven't learned, to let go of their flesh. Not to worry about, like the Lord said, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? And where am I going to live? And I remember this. When I first read this, I was like, no way. I'm going to live without worrying about taking care of myself and God who I can't even see? Are you really there? You're going to take care of me? Yes. And like, all right, I'm going to try this. I gained 30 pounds. I mean, food was coming at me, clothing was coming at me. I didn't have any money. 
It was raining from heaven. Clothing. People were giving me clothing. People were giving me food. Oh, go ahead, eat. I'm like, I ate already. No, eat some more. <laughs> and like when you fast, you notice when you fast, you don't tell anybody. Everybody's telling you to eat. It's like I was watching God take care of me, and I was like, wow, he really will take care of you. King David, I think, said in one of his psalms, I've never seen God's seed begging for bread. You don't need to be a beggar when you're a God seeker. He'll take care of you. Yeah, yeah or nay. And you, but you got you to do what he says. You got to stop thinking about the physical, physical, physical. And I'm not saying that transition is easy to make. It was, it, was a hard, it was a hard transition in my life. It was the best transition I ever made in my life. Because think about living in this world and not worrying about where your next meal is coming from. Think about it. That's liberating. I mean, to be in bondage to, to food and worrying about what you're going to eat all the time, where am I going to live, how am I going to make it. I started playing a game with God. Because, I mean, he, he got me down on the skinny, you know, trying to teach me not to live by bread. And I only had a few bucks in my pocket. And I started playing this game with him because at first I was like, oh, no, oh, oh I'm down to my last few dollars. Oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> and then it became like, ha-ha, I'm down to my last couple bucks. What are you going to do? Hello? What are you going to do, Abba Father? And he, every time, so when the money started going down, instead of getting nervous, I'd get happy. Because I figured, well, how's he going to bring it to me? <laughs> Hello? And how many know he can bring it from every, anywhere, yeah. up here, this way, that way? You don't know where it's coming from. I'll give you an example. God tells me, I want you to take people, people to Israel. At the time when everybody was scared to go to Israel. Very scared. People are suicide bombers, all this crazy stuff. God said, I want you to take people to Israel. Everybody's scared. I, I was like, God, I need a sign. I need... Because everybody's saying, you're crazy, you're local, you're going to go to Israel, you're going to die. God says, I want you to take people to Israel. I said, God, I need a sign. I go to the mailbox one day at the Mishkan, and there's an envelope there. No return address, addressed to the Mishkan, 400 Israeli shekels in cash are sitting in an envelope. I had never seen a shekel in my life. I'm looking at them. I'm like, honey, I asked for a sign. Where are we going to spend 400 shekels? And at the time, it was like $100. with like four shekels to a dollar. I got 400 shekels. In cash, and I go, honey, that's a sign from God. I mean, shekels just show up from the sky. No return address. And cash, somebody sends you cash. I mean, if they're going to send you cash, they're going to send you U.S. dollars. Amen. It was shekels. It was an envelope. It was in our mailbox. No return address, 400 shekels. So we go to Israel. I'm handing out shekels. <laughs> Freely you have received. People are looking at me. Are you sure? Yeah, I got them for nothing here. Yeah. I'm like the biggest tipper in Israel. Does God take care of you? Does he know how to take care of you? And so, amazing, just an amazing, but like I said, the, 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 because the Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because if you notice, most people out there, including many brothers and sisters, I mean, we have to admit it, they're always worried about, you know, their, their, their physical existence. And when you're worried about your physical existence, you're not thinking about God. You're not focused on God. You're not focused on Him. And if you're not focused on Him, you're separated from the power of God. So it's like... The cross to us as believers, those that are saved, it actually means that's how I connect with the power of God. When I, I let go of my flesh. Because he said, pick up your cross and follow me. 
he wasn't saying, I want you to die and be buried because the cross is, is an instrument of death. But he was saying, you pick up your cross and you follow me, he says. Let's look at that in a minute. Matthew 6, are you with me? Yes. Somebody say, this is exciting. Now, as I said, you have a choice. Life, death, good, evil. You have a choice. I mean, all I can do is tell you. I mean, I, I hope that you listen and I hope that you put it into practice, of course. Verse 24 uh, in, in, in Matthew chapter 16, Yeshua speaking, then said Yeshua to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If any man will come after me, in other words, if you're gonna, if you're gonna walk with the Lord, what must you do? You gotta forget the flesh. You just gotta stop worrying about it. Let him worry about it, okay? And see, I mean, put God to the test. Is he the telling the truth or he's not? The only way you're going to find out is if you let go of your flesh and you cleave on to God and see if he really is going to take care of you. Because if he doesn't take care of you, if you follow him, then he's a liar. And as I said earlier, God cannot lie. He does what he says and he says what he does. You can count on what God says. And you could prove, put it to the test. I mean, if it didn't work, do you think I would be standing here talking about this? I would say, book is a comic book. It's for comedians. Because it's not true. But when you put God to the test, you say, whoa, it's true. He's telling the truth. It's amazing. And so, if any man will come after me, verse 24, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But notice what he says in verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall what? Lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. I mean, this only makes sense to people that are saved. Because what do you mean, lose your life for God? You find life? Yeah, you lose your temporary life and you grab onto eternal life. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna trade the temporary for the eternal. I mean, is it a good trade? And he tells you it's a good trade. What happened to the scriptures? You don't like them anymore? <laughs> Devil doesn't want us to see it, huh? I mean, this is way too dangerous for the adversary because he loves carnal. Seven steps to getting rich in Jesus. Money, money, money in Jesus. Are we talking about money? We're talking about the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. We just celebrated receiving the Holy Spirit, the commandments of God. Let's, let's really put some teeth into this. Whoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever, whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Because then he asks the question, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. What shall it profit a man if you if you if you gain the, if you were the richest man on earth? Would you give up your soul for that? Would you trade your soul to be the richest person on the planet? Because he's saying that. I mean, people will give, lose their soul to be rich. But even if you gain the whole world. Honey, if he can't figure it out, you're not going to figure it out. Yeah, he's a computer genius. Look at him. We're in, we're in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. For what man is... Oh. Ah. Doesn't that look beautiful when you see, when you see the Word of God like that? I love looking, and you just look at the Word of God. Because we're not making things up here. We're saying what He says. Amen. And we're trying to understand it. Why does He speak this way? What is He trying to teach us? My words, their spirit, their life. The flesh, He says, profits nothing. In other words, we're not talking about the flesh tonight. We're talking about spiritual things. My words, their spirit, their life. We're talking about... Amazing life, amazing spiritual life. 
We're talking about walking in the power of God and, and really making a difference in your life. For what does a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, what are you willing to give up? Is there anything, all the, all the tea in China, all the gold in Fort Knox, if there's still gold in there? They may not be gold. They said, there may, they said there's no gold in there. But let's say there was. Let's make believe. I mean, would you trade all the gold in Fort Knox, all the tea in China, just for some, some comfort life of 70, 80, 90, 100 years? Whoa, big deal. I want eternal life. I want this amazing eternal life that God is promising, not just when I die, when I die to myself, when I give up this temporary thinking and, and limited power of my physical being, if I could just let go of that and I can grab onto God and I can cleave onto Him like Moses tried to t tell the nation of Israel and I can walk in this amazing eternal power which is in the Spirit of God, which is in the Holy Spirit that's now within me. Does that make sense? I mean, and the only way to experience this is to actually do it yourself. No one can do it for you. And if you honor God with your lips and your heart is far from Him, you're not fooling anybody. You're fooling yourself, the Bible says. You're separated from the power of God and you'll be like everybody else, even though the power's in you and accessible. Somebody say, I want to access the power of God. Go back to 1 Corinthians with it. Are you with me? Come on, more minutes. You know, time's almost up already. Amazing, huh? When you start talking about God and eternity and stuff, you see how the time just flies by? So anyway, where were we? 1 Corinthians. For the preaching of the cross, verse 18, again, is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Does that make sense now? Why is the preaching of the cross for us that are saved? And some people can't handle the cross. It, it freaks them out. But the cross just means you're going to let go of your flesh. Does that make sense? You're going to make God more important than your own flesh. In other words, you're going to lose your life for His sake. And what's going to happen? You're going to find life. You're going to find spiritual life. You're going to find Holy Spirit power life. It's, it's, you're, you're, you're not really, you're giving up, you are giving up, so you're giving up the temporary for the eternal. Are you with me? It's not, it's not that, you're, that you're losing something, you're gaining. With God, you never lose. You always gain because he's a giver. God's not a taker. The devil's a taker. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. But with God, I'm going to give you my life, God. What am I? Oh, I'm losing? No, I win. I gain. I now have eternal life flowing through me. I had temporary life, and I gave it up, and now I've got eternal life. Nice trade. Nice trade, right? I gave up my two-bedroom condo. I got a four-bedroom house. I didn't move to a one-bedroom. I moved to a bigger house. I gave up my old house, and I got a new house. I gave up my old life. I got a new life. I have a much better life. Because people think, oh, no, if you do things for God, you're going to miss out, and you're going to lose, and then, you know, the devil's a liar. You gain. Somebody say, we gain. For it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And then he goes on to say, verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In other words, preaching sounds pretty crazy to the unsaved. But it pleases God. In other words, 
it pleases God, this preaching, it's, it's foolishness of preaching to, the, to save them that believe. Notice verse 22. For the Jewish people require a sign. The non-Jews, the Greeks, seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ, Messiah, crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and non-Jews and Greeks, Christ, Messiah, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So for us that are called, what's Messiah to us? The power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, you're calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things, the foolish things of the world. I mean, people still can't believe. Gabriel's a rabbi? <laughs> yeah, the joke's on you, buddy. Because you think you know something, you know nothing. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That no flesh shall glory in his presence. But of him are we, are you and I in Messiah Yeshua, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. I mean, is this amazing what God has taught us, what we have learned, how to connect with this amazing power, eternal power of God over all the power of the enemy? And only I can disconnect myself and only I can connect myself. It's up to me to choose every day from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, how am I going to walk? Am I going to wake up and worry about what I'm going to eat? what I'm going to wear, where I'm going to live, or am I going to wake up and think about God and hook into God and hook into the power of God and I know it's going to be an amazing day. Amen. Yeah or nay? Yes. Your choice. Because when you glory, you're going to glory in Him. No flesh is ever going to glory in His presence. Because like He said, the flesh profits nothing. My words, Yeshua said, are spirit and they are alive. Somebody stand up and honor them, please. Good stuff. Your choice. Somebody say, my choice. I choose life. And you need to choose it every day. Yay or nay? I mean, after a few years walking this way, you'll be walking on water. I'm prophesying that over you. You're going to walk in the power of God. Somebody say, time to walk in the power of God. Time to stop playing games. Say, I'm not going to play games anymore. Somebody say, I'm getting serious for God. I'm serious for the Lord. I'm serious about walking this way. It's a huge difference. I mean, does it change your whole day? Think about it. You walk with no power during the day, you walk with power. How do you think your day is going to go for you? The, the, the kind of day you have based on the choice you make of how you walk that day. And I'm here to tell you, when you're walking in the anointing and the power of God, your day is going to be amazing. I don't care what's happening out here, you know what's going on in here. And the devils are subject unto us through his name. So if they bother you, like a fly swatter, get lost in the name of Yeshua. Get thee behind me. 
Amen. Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you. Bless your holy name. Gospel, good news, excellent news, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, for the Ruach HaKodesh. Thank you for your commandments. Thank you for your instructions. Lead us, teach us your way, your truth, your life. Show us how to walk in this amazing power that you have given to us over all the power of the enemy to tread on them. Father in heaven, they've treaded on us most of our lives, our families, our friends. Father, teach us to walk, treading on them for a change as more than conquerors, as your word says. Father in heaven, take us from glory to glory, from good to better to best, from salvation to sanctification to redemption to restoration, Lord. Restore our minds, our hearts, our bodies. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation and that we may glory in you, Lord, all the days of our lives, that you will lead us to green pastures, that you will lead us to still waters, that you will restore our soul, that we will be able to abide in your house forever and ever. Amen. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray the name Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. A big amen. Shabbat Shalom. Give the Lord a big hand. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. We're going to close in worship. Stay and break some bread. We got some bread. We got some food, please. say the bedtime Shema before uh, we dismiss the service. As always, we'd like to encourage you to stay, break bread with one another, encourage each other to love and good works. Uh, enjoy this time of fellowship with our Heavenly Father and with one another. We thank you, every one of you, for your support. Thank you for supporting this ministry with your tithes, with your love offerings, and with whatever assistance that uh, the Lord uh, moves upon you to, uh, to help us out. And we're, we're very grateful. It goes a long way to keeping your obedience goes a long way to keeping these doors open. So thank you so much. We're going to be here tomorrow morning. We hope you'll join us at 11 a.m. as the Shabbat continues. In the meantime, let's say the bedtime Shema so we can make sure that our hearts are in the right place, okay? Here we go. Sovereign of the universe, before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, body, work, or all that's mine. Whether willful, careless, accidental, purposeful, or through their speech, by word or by deed in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchut Oleolam Vaed Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. Shabbat shalom. Laila tov.